North Atlantic Ocean sailing to Bernardina Beach, Florida. And a few days ago, the couple that I've been sailing with, uh, they wanted to see the video that I've been working on about what it's like to down back in Mexico and take a ferry across the Sea of Cortez. And it just didn't really seem like it was a video that I was proud of when I was showing it. And I don't know, I think I want my video to feel more authentic and talk about more things that I care about. Maybe no one will care about it, but I think people who are looking these videos up might be a little anxious or uncertain about the place that they're visiting and they want to know more information and it might help to know how someone summoned up the courage to go there in the first place. So maybe I can start out with a question like, has there ever been a time when you felt a lot of anxiety about something, but you decided to override the feeling and the situation turned out better than you thought it would be? I once heard a beautiful thought about how all roads connect. Someone may live 3,000 miles from you, and the directions to get from their house to yours is actually pretty simple. Most of the time, you only have to make a few turns. So, the idea that I could go from my house in Utah all the way to someone's house in Mexico, in just a few turns, made my arms tingle up in that one sort of way that they do when you feel inspired, and you know that you've just got to go for it. But sometimes arm tingling sensations can suddenly go from inspiration to anxiety. Especially when you think about it too much. And the more you think about it, the more you doubt yourself. A hummingbird just flew in my fan. Hi, it's okay. I was getting ready to cross the border to Puerto Penasco, wondering if I was crazy for driving to Mexico alone. At the time, I was reading the book The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, the part when the king of Salem tells the shepherd boy, Santiago, about omens and how they're signs from the universe letting you know when you're on the right path. Don't scare the bird. Nice. I'm not really a sign seeker, but when the hummingbird flew inside my van, I wondered if maybe it was an omen. There you go. It's okay. <laughs> I was still anxious, but knowing how hummingbirds are symbolic of good luck, I took it as a sign that I'll be okay. Hola. <laughs> bueno. Pero no es peligroso acá. Yeah, está no. bien. Oh, sí, está. Se abrió. Está. Sí. Acá guardo mi, no sé cómo se dice, y comida para mi perro. Ah, oh, man. ¿Herramientas? Sí. Sí, mis herramientas. Acá también tengo mis herramientas. Uh, <laughs> Those guys were chill. In fact, pretty much all of the guards at military checkpoints have been chill. I've heard mixed things about blonde white girls traveling alone, but I haven't encountered any problems yet. Maybe it's because I have Maisie traveling with me. I'm 
met a guy on the beach and he was kayaking and he offered for me and Maisie to take my, uh, his kayak out. I only stayed there for a couple of days. I would have stayed there longer, but that guy that lent me his kayak was kind of creeping me out. When in doubt, get the heck out. Wait a minute. Let's talk about this. Earlier, I felt anxiety about crossing and took control of my lizard brain and went anyway. Then I felt a little anxious about the guy that was parked next to me and I left. So, how does one decide to either take or avoid a risk? Here's how to make a good risk assessment. It's important to understand the spectrum of being a wet sandwich on one end or an idiot on the other. As you can see on the graph, low impact and low probability means little to no risk. When both impact and probability increase together, the risk increases as well. By measuring risk with this matrix, someone who has never left the country might say that there's a high probability of me getting wronged and the impact could be as intense as being trafficked or killed. Those are possibilities that I think should always be taken seriously because sadly, it can and does happen. But if we always live life in the green, we might miss out on incredible experiences. Let's take the risk assessment matrix a step further and combine it with the yerkes dotson law. This was created in 1908 by two psychologists who observed that performance increases with physiological or mental arousal, but decreases with too much arousal. So if we apply the risk assessment matrix and say that performance correlates with someone's ability and that stress correlates with risk, we see that there's a space where growth becomes optimal when your ability meets the right amount of risk. Now let's get on with the fun. Just crossed the border. I am now in Juarez. Really easy. They didn't really even, they didn't ask for my passport or anything. Super friendly too. Like way friendlier than Sonoida. Now I have to wait for Juan Carlos, um, Nelly's husband to come meet me somewhere or I might drive to her house. Seems pretty safe so far. Maybe because I'm at the customs, so we'll see. When my close friends, Nelly and Juan Carlos, heard that I had driven across the border, they invited me to drive out to visit them for a spell. I'd flown out to Mexico before to visit her hometown in Cuernavaca, but I never considered driving out to Juarez to visit, considering all the stories I'd read on the news about the drug cartels. But again, when I looked into visiting, I analyzed the risks and rewards. I speak Spanish, I have a junky old van that no one would ever consider breaking into, and I was going to meet her husband at the border and follow him to their place anyway. Risk, medium, growth and connection, optimal. <laughs> Hola, it's un video. Hola. We have Nelly, Juan Carlos. <laughs> he is so nice and is fixing my door. It wouldn't open from the inside or the outside, but he's fixed it so it could open from the inside. He loves Volkswagens, so if he loved Fords more, it would have been fixed <laughs> really fast. <laughs> yeah, we don't love Ford, but we love you. Yeah, we don't love Ford. <laughs> <laughs> we don't love you. <laughs> we don't love you. <laughs> we don't love you. <laughs> We explored downtown Juarez at night. 
It was nice seeing how normal and peaceful the majority of this city probably is most of the time. Oh no, está bien, es perfecto. Gracias. Um, I'm taking their couple's portraits and they are, they are providing the light for the scene. Later, I begged Nelly to make me her famous agua fresca, or horchata. One of my favorite things about meeting with friends is when we share food. I guess most of the time, people share their meals with me and I graciously eat mm -hmm. them. So, yep, yep. I wanted to share something I baked up in my van while I was in New Mexico. <laughs> she is saying that she does not like my blueberries cinnamon rolls <laughs> because she doesn't like lemon but she likes lemon and everything else <laughs> okay let's stop in was it worth the risk to drive to one of the most dangerous cities in the world to visit two of my friends it certainly was <laughs> After driving out to Puerto Peñasco, I felt like a whole new map was opened up to me to explore. A warmer map. One that contained temperatures that were more forgiving to my glow plugs. Not recommended for diesels with glow plugs, which I have. Anyway, my friend Brian invited me to caravan with him and his friends to El Potrero Chico, where there is world-class climbing. There, I met Nick and we talked about driving to Salida to surf. We drove 13 hours to the Pacific coast of Mexico, I bought a surfboard, and then we decided to work our way up to Mazatlan, where we take a commercial ferry across the Sea of Cortez to get to La Paz in Baja California Sur. For the rest of the winter, I lived on the beach in my ambulance with my dog in the southern tip of the peninsula and eventually drove my way back up to the States when I was ready to move on to the next thing. Picking up my laundry. Bye, Maisie. Okay, she sewed up my laundry bag. Aww. Welcome to the juicy Mexico. Mm. Eat a bite. Eat a bite. Oh, wow. <laughs> Good. Mm. What did you get? I have no idea. Welcome to What up? <laughs> Market day where we all feel tall. Climbing today. What are we climbing today? Off the couch. Oh yeah. Can we see the route from here? See the gray? Yes, I see much gray. 
Really aesthetic line. Super obvious. The stoke is no joke. It's 12 pitches? No, seven. Yeah. Seven pitches, 510 Ds, the hardest pitch. It has some 10 Bs, 10 Cs, some nines. Yeah. Woo. Made it to the top. Julie's just about to come up. Booyah, Julie. <laughs> Donna, what do you like? I like. I like. I, I like. I like school. Oh, she likes school. Yeah, she likes you, Donna. Eso te quiere. After being parked for one month at the hostel outside of El Putrero Chico, it was time to leave and explore the surfing side of Mexico. So Nick and I decided to make a 13 hour drive to Sayulita. But on the way there, we stayed overnight at a free campground next to some Mesoamerican ruins. Probably one of the coolest places I've ever parked at. The ruins were closed due to COVID. We found a secret entrance in the back and the groundskeepers were chill and they let us explore this amazing archeological site. Good morning. Today we are heading from La Quemada, driving eight to 10 hours. We don't know how long it's actually gonna take. We have to drive to Guadalajara. Six hours later. Come on. I just bought dry shrimp from someone on the street. Mm. Something that I learned from driving in Mexico is that it is a ton cheaper to fly from place to place when visiting different places in Mexico. The way the geography is doesn't allow easy point A to point B. There are rolling hills everywhere. And on top of that, Mexico doesn't really stay on top of maintaining their roads. The roads that they do maintain are the toll roads, which are very frequent. So not only are you paying for a ton in fuel, you're also paying a ton in tolls and it still takes a long time to get from point A to point B. I do recommend driving though if you are looking to see the whole landscape of Mexico. Oil change day for Stanley. And this amazing May is just chilling. I'm trying to clean my dash. They saved me about $30 for my oil change by letting me go to AutoZone and buy my oil and my filter. I love walking in the jungle sometimes. Actually, there hasn't been a time I haven't liked it yet. One risk that I didn't consider in Mexico was getting my license plate taken away by the government for parking in a prohibited zone. So I drove two hours down to Puerto Vallarta to pay about $15 for the ticket and retrieve my license plate. Got my license plate back. beautiful Sayulita. Hold up. Don't let the serene beach beauty fool you. Another risk to bear in mind is that if you swim here, you'll be lucky to get away without contracting the norovirus, or what expats call the Sayulita sickness. I spent two days feeling horrendously ill, which is no bueno when you're living in a van. 
but after it passed, I was able to go surfing again without any problems. Hey Nick, what happened? <laughs> this is the sound of a van that's uh, been to Mexico. Nick had his catalytic converter cut straight from his van while oh, we were surfing. No. Nobody touched my van though. I mean, who would? It kind of looks like a piece of junk on the outside. But we took that as our cue to start heading north so we can get to Mazatlan and take a ferry to Baja. You can never eliminate the possibility of having mechanical issues when leaving your driveway to go anywhere. Regardless, I feel great about driving a 25-year-old Ford Econoline in Mexico, knowing that Ford is made in Mexico and parts are extremely cheap for the year. And if they don't have the part, Mexican mechanics are extremely talented at jimmy rigging a part for you. I might even say that they can repair it better than the original part. At the TMC, there's Baja Ferries. When looking up information about the ferry, I found the most useful information came from iOverlander, a free app where travelers on the road leave useful pins and tips for places to park, eat, explore, and amenities to use. I pretty much used this app to plan where I'd go. I was super grateful for the users who had left the tips when it came to booking the ferry. There are two options. Taking Baja Ferries, a passenger ferry where you can sleep in a room, but you're not allowed to access your van, and I think pets need to be kenneled. The other option, the one I took, was TMC, a commercial ferry that was at the time half the price at $200. They only charged you for your vehicle. This allowed me to sleep in my van and let Maisie hang out with me in the van or on the deck. I would not recommend buying your ticket in advance. Just show up. Their website is unreliable with the schedule, so Nick and I were able to aboard the day we arrived, but we were prepared and flexible to hang out in Mazatlan if we needed to wait. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm currently sitting in the back corner of a cargo ship, and so it's been 16 hours it took a little over 24 hours to cross, so I made friends with the trekkers along the way. Hola. In Mexico, there are a lot of stray dogs everywhere. A risk you may not have considered is that you might end up with a new family member if you're not careful. I noticed this little camper wasn't part of the pack at the beach we were at. Go to sleep, my little Have a sweet dream tonight. Oh, you're a girl, huh? Close your eyes. And I'll be right here by your side. So let your troubles pass you by. Just know your love no matter what. 
And everything will be alright The world is Joni's lullaby Good night Izzy took careful attention with her So we bathed her, fed her And removed all the sand fleas attached to her body Sadly, the next morning, she disappeared. I think she went off with that dog that approached her on the beach. Hi! <laughs> You're so cute! I can't wait Listen to the sun To go outside and not be the only one But the sun will stay when I'm inside So in my mind I'm with my friends Just having fun Just making some Mediterranean peanut butter power balls for the neighbors. We've got Heather and Eric from Montana right there. And we have Ari from Wyoming. Good neighbors. <clears throat> the state of Massachusetts by the Dropkick Murphys. <laughs> Something that became of great value to me while I lived on the road was how I learned to enjoy solitude. I became friends with myself because I could sit with my thoughts without distractions and learn how to work through uncomfortable feelings. But humans aren't meant to be alone for very long. And I reached a point where I craved to have consistency and community. I felt like it was time to put my roots down somewhere because on my own, I wasn't growing anymore. Plus I ran out of money, so it was time to go home and get back to work. So pretty. So. All right. <laughs> so I just got the Baja Bingo. I'm in the middle of the desert with no cell service, no one in sight, and I got a flat tire. Let's do this. So <laughs> I found the, the hole. It was very complicated. This, they did not make this user friendly. There's Maisie just supporting me. Moral support from afar. Ugh. Can I even get it down now? Oh, I can't even feel my whatever. I'm just glad I found it. I could not figure it out. I have to get this higher. One time, someone messaged me saying that he thinks he speaks for all of my audience when he says he genuinely gets worried about me sometimes. I see where he's coming from. I'm traveling alone in a developing country. I lived in an ambulance that has a lot of character. I'm a woman. 
My life always seems to be in four-wheel drive, as I've gone from firefighting to living in a van to who knows what. I'm pretty open on social media about the hiccups I encounter in my day. And if you're worried, maybe it's because the problems I deal with are very unfamiliar to you. But when I meet other people living this lifestyle, my problems don't face them. They've had their vehicles searched by military carrying massive guns. They've had a broken down van in the middle of nowhere. They understand that their house is going through an earthquake every day on washboard roads, so things have to be fixed once in a while. And there are so many women who are traveling solo. Sometimes we team up and caravan together once in a while. And other times, we choose to be alone, keep our guard up a little extra, and follow our gut. We're not afraid of real adventure. And a real adventure begins when the first thing goes wrong. And if you happen to completely screw up, but you're still alive, don't underestimate your ability to figure things out. No feeling is final. I'm making a big decision. I think I'm going to quit my job today so I can go live on a century old sailboat.